Greetings to all. My name is Sonia Gibbs. I'm Managing Director and Head of Sustainable Finance at the Institute of International Finance, or IIF, here in Washington, D.C. It's a great honor to be here with you today. It's also my very great pleasure to introduce to you today the President and CEO of the IIF, Timothy D. Adams, who will be addressing the following remarks to the 2020 Institute of Global Economics, Hanabank International Conference, Economic Paradigm Shift in the Post-COVID-19 Era and the Future of Finance. And I think, I'm sure, Tim, you'd agree that this is a, an incredibly timely topic. <laughs> it is indeed, and, and thank you, so, Sonia, for having me here today for the Institute of Global Economics. It's a timely uh, time to be addressing these issues, and. Um, I'm just really ecstatic that I could be a part of this conversation today. And we're very pleased to be here, even if we can only be here virtually. We're sorry we can't be with you in person. So, uh, Tim, I, I just wanted to start off with a, a general question here. I mean, you have such a long and distinguished career in public service, and you served as U.S. Undersecretary for International Affairs during the George W. Bush administration. And from that vantage point, I mean, something people are clearly very worried about is the risk of deglobalization. And is this affecting the world's ability to respond effectively to and ultimately recover from this pandemic? Uh, it's a, a, a great question, Sonia, and, and the short answer is yes. Uh, it's long and complicated, but we have seen this uh, trend of deglobalization that's been in place now for several years. And it's really unfortunate because the, the, the arc architecture that was uh, put in place after World War II that has kept the peace and contributed prosperity for close to 80 years has truly been remarkable in terms of uh, human history or modern economic history. And it's with great sadness that I see so many capitals, including here in Washington, a movement away from that global architecture and its many successes. Uh, so we, there is some concern. There's some specific concern, especially with respect to dealing with the pandemic. As you've seen, there's been some walking away or backtracking from support for the World Health Organization, as well as uh, the criticism of other uh, institutions. And, you know, I can't remember a, a crisis, and I've been in Washington for 35 years, a crisis in which we didn't have, uh, you know, combined and coordinated leadership at the very top of the, of the political uh, spectrum. Uh, you know, whether it was the uh, Asia financial crisis or whether it was, uh, the, you know, back in the 70s when we had the Arab oil embargo and really the launching of the G5 and the G7 or the great financial crisis just 10 years ago and the numerous summits that uh, uh, succeeded uh, in the following days and months of that crisis, whether it was in uh, London or Washington or Pittsburgh or, or Seoul, uh, we saw the global community coming together uh, to solve a global problem. And in this crisis, it, the leadership just hasn't been there and the cooperative spirit just hasn't been there. And I think that's incredibly unfortunate. Well, and it's so, it's, it's incredibly timely that our friends at the Institute for Global Economics and Hana Bank are bringing people together on this occasion to, to discuss these issues. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that we worry about a lot, keeps us up at night at the IIF here, is the massive accumulation of, of global debt over the past couple of decades. So are you concerned that the, the big fiscal response that's been necessary for, for COVID will exacerbate these problems? And is there any will in the political community to be more fiscally conservative going forward? Does debt matter anymore? <laughs> yeah. Uh, a, a great question, Sonia. As you know, we're in the fourth great debt cycle in the post-war era, and you and your team do a remarkable job of covering uh, debt analysis. Our uh, debt monitor is widely distributed and recognized globally as one of the best uh, indicators and insights into this debt accumulation that we've uh, seen over the past 10 years. And as you pointed out and point out frequently, uh, debt levels, whether it's at the sovereign or household or corporate level, have reached historic highs. This is all pre-crisis. Uh, and with the crisis, we're seeing a rapid acceleration in the accumulation of debt. Again, household, corporate, and sovereign levels to, uh, to really levels we haven't seen since the, the, the post-war era. Uh, the UK will uh, hit uh, debt to GDP levels that they've not seen since the 1960s, the US since the 1940s. So we are levering up 
uh, quickly and rapidly uh, and broadly on top of what was already a huge debt surge. Uh, and uh, while I recognize the importance of responding to this crisis globally with massive fiscal firepower, uh, we need to address this crisis. We need to ensure that we can support uh, demand uh, in terms of keeping the real economy going. At some point, we're going to have to address how do we pay off this debt? Uh, a lot of it is on uh, uh, balance sheets of central banks, but at some point, and it's not in the next year or two, but at some point, we're going to have to address how we deal with this massive debt overhang and how we ultimately begin to wind it down, which will take decades. Well, that really brings us right to the focus of this session today, which is on the, the financial sector. And so from that vantage point, debt's very important to the financial sector, obviously. How do you see the pandemic affecting the financial sector? Do you see growing risk of more delinquencies and non-performing loans? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, fortunately, the reforms that were put in place in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, uh, 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 such as more capital. So, for example, the banks globally raised over $3 trillion worth of high quality capital. Uh, we've had less leverage, more liquidity. We've been stress testing our systems. <clears throat> you know, a whole host of changes that have been put in place make the financial sector much more vibrant. <clears throat> and in fact, we are now part of the solution rather than part of the problem. We're not amplifying. We're actually acting as a buffer for the crisis. So from that perspective, it's quite positive. And, and the points I make are widely recognized and widely echoed by uh, financial authorities. Uh, but we will see huge changes in the industry. Already, when you have 90 or 95, or in some instances, close to 98% of your workforce working from home, there are huge operational challenges and risks in terms of resiliency and, and cyber uh, resiliency, operational re resiliency. How do you function from home? I don't think JP Morgan or any other major global entity ever thought they'd see that kind of operational profile. Uh, two is, as you point out, uh, we will see a rise, a fairly rapid rise in uh, insolvencies uh, in, uh, across the board. And there may be whole sectors, whole industries, whether it's airlines or uh, other forms of hospitality and leisure that, have, that will witness and experience uh, permanent damage and will have to uh, be addressed in terms of banks' balance sheets. So we're going to have to find ways to uh, think about how banks deal with that over the long term. And then how do we deal with these crises? How do we use our capital buffers? How do we ensure we have sufficient liquidity? And then our market making operations, which were made uh, much more constrained in terms of the crisis and the, the reforms. How do we ensure that we have the resiliency in terms of our balance sheets so that we can respond to market making and market dynamics going forward? Now, that's a really good point, and it, it does raise the question of how the regulatory community is responding in, during this pandemic, uh, for example, with regard to, to banks' treatment of the assets that are being affected by these rising delinquencies and, and credit problems. Well, indeed. Well, so a number of things have happened. Obviously, central banks have put their balance sheets behind uh, the banks and are purchasing uh, corporate debt off the secondary market or off the run uh, commercial paper, uh, uh, asset-backed securities. So the Fed alone has nine new facilities that is being deployed to backstop the financial sector. So in some ways, the public balance sheet is behind uh, the private banking balance sheet, but still our balance, our balance sheets will uh, face duress because of a rise in NPLs. And so that's something we need to bear watching. And we we're just talking with one leading financial uh, supervisor or regulator today who talked about maybe we've made the capital stack of our banks far too complex. Uh, the various uh, TLAC and tier one and tier two and how we think about capital and the variety of buffers, uh, maybe we need to simplify it. So regulators are starting to ask the question, not only how do we re respond to this crisis, but how do we do a look back once it's, we're, we're stable enough and ask ourselves, was the regulations put in place appropriate? Was it too complex? Was it too much? are not enough? And how do we uh, fix that going forward? How do we fine tune uh, the regulatory structure once we're uh, safely past this crisis? No, indeed. I think many would agree with you on the complexity of the, the capital structure there. But um, so in this slide and in this context with the regulatory response and the pandemic response, 
do we think that have banks been doing the right thing in terms of helping their clients, their employees, their shareholders through these very difficult times? Uh, well, absolutely. You know, uh, there is obviously the challenge of trying to uh, maintain capital uh, as well as return it to your shareholders. And we've seen that's been a bit of an issue in Europe and the U.S. where supervisors and regulators have said, at least in Europe, uh, we prefer that you not pay out dividends, that you husband your resources, that you uh, keep your capital levels uh, sufficiently high and provision uh, given the, the coming wave of NPLs. In the U.S., uh, the, the banks have voluntarily given up on buybacks. There has been no official declaration in terms of uh, dividends, and I don't suspect that will happen anytime soon. So it's, it's managing and, and, uh, and balancing the needs of your shareholders uh, with also the needs of your employees. How do you take care of your employees when obviously you know, 90 percent plus are working from home? How do you reboard them? Uh, in a way that makes it safe and, and putting their health interests uh, first and foremost. We have the same challenge at the IF as we just uh, today actually reopening our offices. But I don't suspect that our employees will return until probably uh, the fourth quarter at the earliest, simply because we want to make sure they're comfortable uh, in, in the new environment. And I hear that from CEOs globally. And we have to rethink about what does office space look like? Do we need large office towers in Canary Wharf or in Midtown Manhattan? Might we... Uh, uh, be more distributed in the way in which we work and where our employees are located. Uh, so there's a whole host of different ways we've been thinking about it. And then just continued support for our communities. <clears throat> We're supporting the real economy, continuing to lend uh, to our clients and our customers and to communities. Uh, I hear that from every CEO, uh, continue to make sure that we have sufficient capital for the real economy. And bankers have been doing that. We have been providing capital wherever we can, uh, often in times uh, with, uh, in concert with public authorities, uh, depending on which country, but we have been active in supporting the real economy. Mm -hmm. All really great points. And one other question that, that often arises in connection with the future of finance and future for the financial sector is one of consolidation. I mean, is COVID perhaps going to accelerate a process of consolidation, either in banking or asset management or elsewhere in the financial services industry? Uh, yeah, another great question, uh, Sonia. I, I think we're gonna see a number of trends that have been in place for some time accelerate uh, the digitization of finance, both in terms of the front end, the user experience, as well as the back end taking costs out. And I think what we'll see with the huge technology spins that have uh, been occurring previous to uh, COVID-19, you know, uh, banks like uh, Bank of America or JP Morgan or, uh, you know, Barclays, you know, spending billions of dollars on technology, which makes it very difficult for small banks to do so. In the U.S., we have about 5,000 banks. We had about 10,000 banks 15 years ago. So we're seeing consolidation in the industry simply because you need scale and simply because of the uh, amount of money one must spend in order to invest in the latest technology. And I think we're going to see in the asset management business, we've seen a real shift to passive management from active management. Margins are thinning out, and uh, we're already seeing you know, such you know, institutions such as BlackRock and others uh, grow ever larger. They're certainly really good at what they do. But I would suspect we'll see other asset managers consolidate over time, just as margins are thinning and the nature of uh, investment behavior by households continue to shift. So you mentioned the, the U.S. Uh, financial sector, and I, I wonder if you could share your perspectives, uh, thinking of the long experience that you've had with the U.S. How do you see U.S. financial regulation evolving, either under a Trump or a Biden administration in November? Yeah, sure. Well, we've had uh, three and a half years of experience under a Trump administration, so I would suspect that we continue to see a, continu a continuation of what's been in place. And I would, I would refer to it so much as a light touch, but one of allowing the industry to evolve and focus more on supervision and less on regulation. There's been a tremendous amount of regulatory changes put in place over the last 10 years, almost to the point of exhaustion. So I think we have seen a shift in the U.S. towards uh, you know, more supervision, less regulation, and let's really understand what we put in place so that we can understand whether or not all that was needed and whether it's counterproductive. And again, back to the point where there are particular regulations put in place. So we make the system so complex that it made this 
it made it more difficult to respond in terms of this crisis. Under a Biden administration, uh, it's, it's not clear. It really depends on who uh, President Biden would put in in key roles at the Federal Reserve or the FDIC or the Office of the Comptroller of Currency or even at the Treasury. If he goes with the traditional sort of Clinton-Obama administration officials, centrist, thoughtful Democrats, then I think you'll see a similar trend of what we've seen over the last few years. If he tacks to more to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, then it could be a, a much more challenging environment for banks going forward. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but I certainly can't discount uh, that as a possible option for a Biden administration. So I, for our uh, last question here, uh, why don't we switch to uh, financial markets and, you know, just kind of looking ahead, do you think that uh, financial assets are correctly pricing the shape of, of recovery? Maybe our stock market's getting too optimistic or do credit markets accurately price a big progress that could lie ahead of us? Uh, yeah, boy, the markets have been very buoyant. And uh, in my mind, they're sort of priced to perfection. And it's no surprise when you've got the amount of quantitative easing that we've seen put in place in, you know, in, uh, in Asia, in Europe, uh, and in the U.S. There's a tremendous wall of capital out there in search for yield, and it's really uh, 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 supporting prices and uh, suppressing uh, yields and spreads. Uh, you know, back in March, for example, Sonia, you know that we saw this historic outflow of capital from the emerging markets, from the frontier markets, and from many low-income countries. And now we're actually uh, seeing a reversal of that just uh, uh, two months later as uh, investors uh, sitting on close to $2 trillion of cash in the U.S. alone are looking to deploy that capital in a way where they can generate returns. And you can't generate returns off of buying U.S. treasuries or gilts or, you know, any other uh, bonds or any other sovereign assets. So the search for yield uh, and the effects of quantitative easing sending investors out the risk curve means that uh, prices are, are, are pretty buoyant. And uh, to me, it seems like it's front running the real economy. I think there's still real challenges. There is a recovery in the global economy, but I don't think the recovery is as robust or as, as progressed sufficient to warrant the prices that we're seeing. Thank you, Tim. You've been very generous with your time, and I think we will hand over now to the rest of the session and give our thanks to the Institute for Global Economics and, and Hannah Banks for, for having us here today. Thank great. You. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. I wish you all the best. All the best for a great conference. Thank you for allowing me to be here today.